It's pretty cool to be able to link up in prayer. Amen? Amen. Almost feels normal in here. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, thank you for the way that you reach down from heaven to start relationship with us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you today for his sacrifice, for his love, for his forgiveness, for making us a part of your family by faith in him. Lord, we don't take that for granted. Lord, we set aside all the things today that could get in the way, that could distract us from seeing you and knowing you more. God, we pray, have your way in us today. Have your way in our hearts today. Not just for the moments that we're here, but Lord, that you and your kingdom would take root in our lives. Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We love you and thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's clap to the Lord. All I know, 
mountain, good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. He's my heart song in my song. comes from Psalm 16, verse 8. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father, we praise you today, and we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people and that you dwell in our praise. So we lift high your name today. We lift you up, Lord, and we thank you for the fullness of joy that is found in your presence and that the joy of the Lord can be our strength each and every day. And we choose today to walk and step with you, Father God. Lord, I pray that when the world looks at us, that they would see Jesus. I pray that we would be your hands and your feet, Lord, as we serve one another. And Lord, we know that it is not us Father, but it's you working in us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory, that you work in us and through us, and that we just need to be surrendered. So, Father, we surrender to you today. You are welcome, Father. We give you permission to put your finger on something in our lives that still needs to be surrendered to you, God. And we walk forward in obedience to you. And we give you our lives. We give you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only 
so worthy Lord so worthy just like this song says Lord of everything we could ever sing or say or do you're worthy there's nobody like you Lord thank you for your great love for us Lord forgive us for falling falling in love with things that could never love us back Lord, we want you to be King of kings and Lord of lords in our hearts today. We want our lives to be full of your love, not so that it could just benefit us, but that you could flow into us and you could flow through us, and that as other people see you flowing through us, that they would look to you. Lord, that you'd get all the glory and the praise and the honor. It's, it's all about you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us to be that witness to those around us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So today we have uh, a special privilege. We are going to do a baby dedication. And here at Open Bible... We, we don't believe in infant baptism. We believe in dedicating children unto the Lord. We believe that baptism is a part of something that takes place in a person's life when they profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so then the Holy Spirit comes in and washes them. And being baptized in water, being immersed in water, is an outward sign of an inward work that Jesus has become Lord and Savior in their heart. And that's God's plan for everybody. But we do believe 
in infant dedication because what we want to do is we want to say, Lord, we present this child before you. We recognize that his spirit has come from you. We pray your protection and provision over his life. Bring him to that place where he can make a decision or she can make a decision for themselves to follow you as Lord and Savior. So we have the opportunity today, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Chris and Jackie Wytrolic to come up with the newest addition to their family, who is Jonah, Michael, right? And, and, and any other family members that you want to have come up, this stage is well enforced. We can put as many people up here as you'd like to bring up this morning. I have you guys stand right up here in front with me, not too close so nobody jumps off. <laughs> Hallelujah. I really appreciate Chris and Jackie. Um, I'll say of Chris, Chris is a really hard worker. He puts in a lot of hours to provide for our family. He's a great provider. Chris has also served here at Open Bible as uh, one of our in-stay facilitators. And so I really appreciate Chris's ministry in that. I appreciate Jackie so much. She is a great mom. Not only does she make her family look good, she also takes care of our spiritual family as she serves down in our nursery. And uh, we couldn't do, do it without you. Not only because you keep bringing babies into the nursery, but because you... <laughs> keep providing care for the rest of the families that are there. Also this morning, we have up here with us Noah and Nehemiah and Hannah. Give them a round of applause. They're doing a good job up here as well. So Jonah Michael is all decked out today. I didn't know if he was getting dedicated or married, you know. It's kind of that prearrangement thing. But very, very strong biblical names in this family. I love it. That is awesome. In Hebrew, the name Jonah means dove. A dove, of course, is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, Jonah was a prophet or a spokesman for God. The name Michael means who is like God. And when I think of the name Michael, I think of Michael the archangel, who is like God, and is mentioned both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So today, we are praying and believing that Jonah Michael Wytrolic will not only be a spokesman for God, but that he will be like his heavenly Father, because he will live closely in relationship with Jesus Christ, his Lord. Can you say amen? amen. So I want to share a scripture uh, over Jonah's life today. You're just cheesing it up up here. <laughs> That's awesome. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. I believe the Lord gave me these verses over, over his life. So someday you'll be able to read these to him or he can watch the video. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Here are some reasons why I think the Lord led me to share these verses today about Jonah. First, I believe that Jonah is going to be a very sincere young man. I believe that Jonah will have maturity beyond his years. I believe that even at a young age, he will have an assurance of faith that comes from knowing God and drawing close to God. So, Chris and Jackie, your job as parents is to encourage him in that. Not only to encourage him to draw close, but for you guys to teach him, to train him, to model that for him. I see you guys, and probably have said this before about your other kids, but I see you guys reading the Word together. But I also see a day that, and, and this isn't when he's like 16 years old, you guys are reading the Word, there's going to come a day not too long from now when he can read, and you're going to have him read the Word. And you guys are going to be praying over him and praying for family members, but there's going to come a day, not when he's 16 or 17, but when he's 5, 6, and 7, when he lays hands on you and he prays for you because you're teaching him and training him. I believe there's going to come a day where he, you're going to witness him sharing Christ with others not when he's 27, 28, but when he's 12, 13, 14, that he is going to be doing that, and you're going to step back and say, wow, God, 
Did we do that? And God will say, well, you were part of it. You were part of teaching and training him. That's what we're called to do as parents to teach our kids how to draw near to the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That word will not return void. Some of us as parents today need to hang on to that word. Hang on to it, okay? Because it won't fail. Chris and Jackie, will you endeavor to raise up Jonah in the way that he should go according to the word of the Lord? I believe that. You guys are great parents. We love you. Congregation, we are Jonah's spiritual family. Amen? So it is our privilege to love them, to bless them, to encourage them, to give them birthday gifts, to babysit. I didn't hear any amens out of that one. We're a spiritual family, right? And that's our, that's our job together. If you uh, would bless them with me in prayer this morning, just stretch out your hand. We're going to pray a blessing over them. Heidi, I'll just anoint, anoint Jonah real quick. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this little one today. Lord, I thank you that mom and dad have poured themselves into him, but you yourself have poured your spirit into him. We thank you, Father, for this eternal spirit that's in him. We pray, Lord God, that you'd protect him, that you'd provide for him, that you would allow him to be raised up in the way that he should go, that he will know you from a very early age and that he will draw near to you in Jesus' name. Lord, that he would take a hold of the finger of God, be led of you, Lord God, and know you. Lord, that he'd be able to operate. We thank you for his sincerity. We thank you for his maturity. Lord, we pray that you would bless him today. Bless Chris and Jackie. Bless this whole family as they bear the name of Jesus on their family. I pray that you'd meet every one of their needs. Give Chris and Jackie all the energy that they need, all the wisdom and direction and guidance, and bless this little one today. Lord, bless him and lead him, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give them a round of applause today? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Beautiful family. Beautiful family. Great job. Well, if any of the rest of you want to start having babies, we'd be happy to get you up here. We're going to grow this church one way or another. Hallelujah. What, a, what an awesome family. So last week we started a, a series uh, about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ. You can use all those phrases interchangeably. Today we're going to continue on in that series as we talk about participating in the kingdom, but I want to give you a recap from last week. Part one, we started to talk about and get an understanding of what the kingdom of God is. We know that the kingdom of God is unseen yet it's eternal. And while it's unseen, it might feel like, oh, that's kind of make-believe. But we understand from Scripture that even the things that we see that were made, they were created from the things that were unseen, from the spirit realm into a physical realm by the speaking of the Word of God. Okay, So the kingdom of heaven is real, and it is more wonderful than anything that you could ever think of or imagine. Today I want to start out looking at a description of the kingdom of God that's found in Revelation chapter 21. We'll pick up reading together at verse 9, and I'm going to read several verses. Uh, I think it's great. Some of you have probably slacked off on your Bible reading anyway, so you're going to get a little extra time in this morning. Uh, I know they say, you know, they probably advise pastors, hey, when you're reading, you don't want to read more than four or five verses at a time. Whatever. Let's just get in the Word today, okay? Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to John and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. 
On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three uh, on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. Just to give you some perspective, 12,000 stadia is 1,400 miles. 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles uh, wide. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits, or 216 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. That's, those are some big pearls. Amen. The great street of the city was gold as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth. You know who the kings of the earth are. It's you and I, Revelation 1.6, for we are a kingdom of priests. Revelation 1.6, it refers to us as kings. will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gate ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What an awesome description. I love scripture because it is so deep. And even as I'm reading through that, there's a lot of questions that I have and then thoughts and other scriptures that come to mind and it's like, whoop, blowing my mind up in there. We don't have the time to kind of delve, delve into all these things this morning, but I would encourage you, if that's one of your first times hearing a description about the kingdom of heaven, is for you to look at that again and ask the Lord to even give you more understanding about that. The kingdom of heaven is awesome. Hallelujah. And I believe that God wants us to participate in the kingdom of heaven in eternity as a king and as a part of the bride of the lamb, but God doesn't want us to wait until we get there. No, there's an invasion that has come to earth. The kingdom of heaven has come to earth, and God wants us to participate in his kingdom in the here and the now. We begin participating in the kingdom with a right response. Last week we talked about the right response. And the right response is to repent. John the Baptist came and he preached a baptism of repentance. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. What does it mean to repent? It means to change your mind. God wants us to change our mind about the world we live in and about sin to turn away from those things and begin to turn to him, to begin to embrace him as Lord and Savior, and to embrace his kingdom. He wants us to be active in it and participate in it in the here and now. We, with the help of the Holy Spirit, change our minds about sin in such a way where sin begins to lose its enticement or desire. It's really hard to be tempted by something that you're not interested in. While we live in this world and we live in this body, we'll always be subject to a form of temptation. But I want you to know, and I can say from personal experience, there's things in my life that I used to be tempted about that I'm not tempted nearly as much, or if at all, before. Why? Not because of my own strength and ability and power and all that stuff. No, I don't have, I can't do that. But it's because of Christ inside of me, his kingdom, his spirit, the spirit of his kingdom working inside of me. That's the power, the power to not only transform your spirit, but to begin to transform your soul so that you fall out of love with the things of the world and you fall into love with the one who created heaven and earth. Amen. It's, it's, it's powerful and God wants us to participate in it. We need to understand that Christ's kingdom comes or extends wherever his will is done. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Jesus be began teaching his disciples how to pray. 
in this series, I think we'll come back to the Lord's Prayer because I want to talk to you about praying the kingdom. Um, but today I want to just read a part of this as we talk about participating in the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. Prayer is very important because prayer is our communication point with God. And communication, conversation, should not just be one-sided. It shouldn't just be us talking to God. But there should be a point in time where we're just still and listening and letting God speak to us. Okay, When we speak to God, okay, I think, I think it's important that we don't just come to God with all of our concerns and requests. And he's able to handle all those, and he wants to hear those. You know, but when I think about a relationship, when somebody comes and talks to me, if the only thing they ever talk about is what they need from me, that seems very one-sided. But when we go to God and we say, God, you are awesome, hallowed be your name, you are holy, you are lovely, you are beautiful, you are wonderful, this is the way that we should begin our time of communication and prayer. Notice in verse 10 here, Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a spiritual principle. We need to understand that God's kingdom extends to wherever his will is done. Let me say that again. God's kingdom extends to wherever his will is done. When we do his will, it's called obedience. When we do his will, when we're obedient, what happens is when we're obedient to Christ and his rule and his truth and his command, what happens is his kingdom is extended into our lives, and then he wants his kingdom to be extended through our lives. We begin to participate in the kingdom through repentance. That's the right response. So in response to the fact that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins, that we would say, I'm a sinner. I confess that to you. I can't save myself. It's by your grace that I've been saved. That's the right response. I turn from sin. I turn from the world, and I turn to you. So we respond rightly first through repentance, but secondly, we continue to participate in the kingdom of God through obedience. Let me ask you this morning, are you participating in the kingdom through obedience? If we're not being obedient, we can't participate in the kingdom. No matter how much we'd like to say we can, think we can, to participate in the kingdom means to be a part of doing his will. Where his will is done, his kingdom comes. He wants to invade not only heaven but earth, your life with the spirit of his kingdom when you put your faith in him. You do that when you repent, and you do that day by day, moment by moment, as you decide to be obedient to him. Jesus said it like this in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Jesus said, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What did he say? The kingdom's here. The kingdom's near. Why is the kingdom near? Because the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he has that, that written on his thigh. The king of kings and the Lord of lords was close to them. Amen? Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Here's the truth about what we believe. You demonstrate what you believe in how you obey. When the Bible talks about faith, when it talks about belief, it's not just talking about something that you think up here. It's talking about something that you do. When it says in Hebrews 11, consider Abraham, God spoke to him about a land, about a promised land, and Abraham obeyed not because he said, okay, I'll go there someday, God, but because he left and went, he did it. Here's the thing. I'll give you an example. If in five seconds, I believed that a semi-truck was going to crash through this wall, okay? Five, four, three, two, one. I would not still be standing here, okay? He gone, all right? Because that's what I would believe. I can say I believe something, but what you believe is what you do. It's not just what you say. It's not just what you think. What you believe in is demonstrated in how you move. It's how you live your life. Acts 17, 28 says it like this. It's in him we live and move and have our being. Have our being. It's who you are. Amen? God wants your being 
to belong to him. Here at, here at Open Bible, and I'll probably talk about this a little today in the membership class, but we believe that everybody is called to ministry, okay? And that the, what does it mean to minister? That means to meet the needs of others. So simply, simply put, we minister when we serve, okay? We talked about that last week as we talked about the kingdom where Jesus said the last will be first and the first will be last. When you make yourself a servant of all, that's really when you start to become great in the kingdom. It took the disciples a little while to get that thing, teaching, but it takes us a little while to get that teaching too, right? God wants us to be operating and participating in his kingdom. Our goal is for the ministry to flow from who we are. Ministry flows from being. Ministry isn't just something that you do. Because I'll be honest with you, there's been times where I've done ministry with a bad attitude. Now, you wouldn't be able to tell that because I'm happy, smiley Pastor Andy on the outside. <laughs> okay? But on the inside, I'm about ready to go a little Popeye the Sailor Man on you, okay? <laughs> That's not... God's not saying, serve me, mind over matter, this and that. No, he's saying, let my kingdom invade your life. Let ministry flow from who you are in me. Live and move and have your being inside of me. Because when that happens and people come in contact with you, they come in contact with the kingdom. Amen? One of our goals, well, I'll, I'll tell you a few of our goals as a church. I might as well just do membership class right now. Anybody want to be a member? <laughs> do it right now. Really, what, one of the things that the Lord, I, I feel like the Lord has challenged us as, as a church, and these are goals that he has given me for, for us as a church. I believe that God wants everybody to be a part of ministry, and that ministry flows from being, and that you're gifted when you, when you have, invite Jesus to be Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. You have a gift, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, talks about the gifts. You have those gifts, and God wants you to be a part of the ministry. Not primarily in this church, because we don't spend most of our time here. We need to learn how to be ministers outside of the church, right? So the church can grow. Secondly, I believe that God wants everybody to be a part of a group, a life group, a small group, a class, or something like that. Because Hebrews 10 says one of the functions of the body is for us to encourage one another. We need that encouragement. If the only time you're getting encouraged is the five minutes you show up before service and the five minutes afterwards, I know some of you got to track you down before you get to the door, okay? Just because I hope I can get a hug. And I want you to be, I would love for you to be a part of a group so that you can get that encouragement. So everybody having a ministry, everybody having uh, a group, Lastly is, I believe that God wants every single one of us to be operating in a personal relationship with him by being in his word daily, okay? Say, what percentage, Pastor Andy, do you think of the congregation is in the word daily? I don't know. I might be afraid to know. I don't even know. But I know this. I know, I know that not everybody has a desire to be in God's word daily. And I know that from personal experience. Because I know there's been seasons of my life where I was like, I don't want to be in the Word. I mean, I'll do what's right, and I want to go to heaven and all that, but I don't feel like being in the Word. You don't have to raise your hand, but you know what I'm saying? Because I got too much to do. I got to do this, I got to do that, and if I get any me time, I want it to be me. I don't want it to be that. I've been deceived, right? And, and God, here's... here's Here's what I know from personal experience. You will not have a desire for God's word until you take him at his word and start by being obedient. You, some people might say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be religious and I don't want to go against myself and I don't want to be this or that. You're not, you're not doing that, but what he says is you draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. When you become obedient. How do we begin to participate in the kingdom? The first response is repent. How do we continue to participate in the, in the kingdom? Is the next response is being obedient. God wants you to be obedient, to be in relationship with him every day. And the best way for you to do that is to be in the word because when you're in the word, it's not just you talking to God, it's him talking to you through his word. Amen? And then that word begins to take hold. The kingdom 
begins to take hold inside of you and change you. Hallelujah. And that's what we need. God wants us to be in his word every day. Are we going to be obedient to get in the word? When we're not, what do we do? We develop an appetite for fleshly things because that's what we feed on. But if you will begin out of obedience to feed on the word with a sincere heart, you will discover that there's nothing more satisfying spiritually. I want to encourage everybody here today because you know what? I love being a spiritual family and I love the social part of being a family, but we are not a social club. That's not what we were called to be. Not that being social is bad. We're called to be a spiritual family in Jesus Christ. That our relationships, they're made up of something more than common interests. They're made up of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Are we going to be obedient to get into his word? Are we going to be obedient to resist sin? In my life, the two are tied together. If I'm not obedient to be in the word, it's much harder to resist sin. But when you're walking in the Word, you're living in the Word, and the Word's acting like a shield, and the Word is working in your life, I'm telling you, it gets so much easier. that I can say from experience, there were things that I was tempted with in, in the past, and I'm not saying that I'm above any form of temptation. As long as you live in this body, you're going to experience temptation. But I can tell you, there are things that I was tempted by in the past, and that I, I honestly, wholly, because of Him and His victory, I hate it now. I hate them. Because the Bible says, hate what's evil, cling to what's good. How can you be enticed by something that you hate? I'm telling you, this isn't me. It's the, and, and I'm not, it's the power of God at work within us. It's his kingdom coming, him establishing his truth, his word, his values, his desire, so that ministry, who we are, how we live, how we move, flows from who we are in him. It comes naturally. It's not something that we have to force or put on. James chapter 4, verse 7 says this, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What's the first part of that? Submit. submit. When you submit, you come under. It's like, well, it's not about me. I'm coming under. I'm submitting to the plan of the one who is above me. Submit to God's plan. When you submit to God's plan, then you can do part number two. You can resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Hallelujah, because he's not going to have anything over you. You cannot resist temptation if you have not first surrendered yourself to God. When you submit yourself to God through his word, that type of obedience will even begin to transform your desires so that you fall in love with Jesus, not the world. It's so much easier to resist temptation when you're not in love with it, right? So we read about the kingdom of God today in Revelation chapter 21. Now I want to talk to you about three things that the kingdom of God includes. Okay, three, three things that the kingdom of God includes. The first two of these things we won't go in depth on today. We'll come back to those later in the series, and we'll talk about the third one a little more in depth. The first one is this. The kingdom of God includes the rule of Christ in heaven and on earth. His kingdom comes where his will is done. That's why it's important to be obedient. When you're obedient to get into the word of God, the kingdom invades your life. It's true. Point number two, the blessings that flow from living under Christ's rule, that's included in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God includes the blessings that flow from living under Christ's rule. Rule. So once you become a part of his family, you have, a, you have an inheritance. Woohoo! You've got a kingdom come. Hallelujah. Right? And you get a new spirit. Praise be to God. And you get redemption. That's a part of your inheritance where he begins to redeem your, your mind and your soul. And eventually he's going to redeem your body. And it's a, it's a package. You might work for a company. And you've got a package. The kingdom package is better than your package. All right? It's so much better. It includes, and so all those blessings. Now, as we find out more about the kingdom, what I hope that we do is that we'll discover the inheritance that we have because if we don't know what we have coming, we won't expect to receive it. Okay? We may not know, oh, I didn't know I had that benefit. I'm certainly not operating in it. I need to learn how to access that. Okay, point number three is this. The kingdom of God includes the subjects right? Those people who are in submission to Christ, the subjects or the people of the kingdom. 
I want to talk to you today by, about participating in the kingdom by being obedient in our relationships. Okay? So, when I get done with a message, um, and it, it, it takes a while, it's, a, it's an interesting process. So I try to listen to God throughout the week, and then I take notes in my phone, and then I think about scriptures, and I write those down and lay all that out, and especially in a series, lay all that out, and then start putting it together. But I always try to maintain an attitude of prayer throughout because ooh, God's word's so awesome. I feel like, man, in my flesh, I can fall so far short of presenting what he wants me to share. And I say, God, if I've missed something or if, there, if I'm off, Lord, just show me. Okay, I don't care if the message sounds good. It just it needs to be your word going forth. So as I was doing that in prayer the other day, after I kind of was working on this, one of the things the Lord spoke to me very clearly was, before you can do anything in the kingdom, you must allow the king to do something inside of you. That's why ministry flows from being. Before you can do anything for God, you have to let God do something inside of you. Because if not, you're going to run the risk of doing whatever you want to do in your own strength or for your own reputation rather than letting it flow from who you are in Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me ask you today, are you being obedient in or with the relationships that God has given you? Are you being obedient? Are you being first obedient in that relationship with Jesus to be in the word every day so that the kingdom of God is invading your life through the truth of his word? We were chosen in Christ to extend his kingdom into relationships. God wants, God wants his kingdom, for, if you're a believer today, if you've put your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, God wants his kingdom to come into your life and to be extended into your relationships. So if you're married, he wants the kingdom to come into your life and be extended in your marriage. He wants the kingdom to be extended to your children, uh, your, your family members, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. When people come in contact with you, he wants them to come in contact with his kingdom. Somebody might ask, yeah, but you don't, you don't know this person like I do. Because whoever that person is, and we may all have somebody like this in our lives, whoever that person is, they might seem like not only disinterested, but they might be like, I want to have nothing to do with that. You talk about Jesus and they look like they want to tear you apart. Okay? So how in the world am I supposed to share Jesus? How in the world am I supposed to extend the kingdom to somebody like that? What if they act like they're totally against it? What if all they do is reject it? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 for the answer. So here we're talking about, I'll sum it up for you. So we're talking about participating in the kingdom. And to participate in the kingdom, we need to have right response. The first response is repent, change of thinking. To continue to participate, we need to be obedient. Okay, That keeps us in the right position. And we're talking about being obedient in the relationship that you have with Christ to be in the word every day with him so that the kingdom can flow inside of you and the kingdom can flow out of you. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we live in the world... We do not wage war, we don't fight, we don't engage in battle as the world does it. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. They're not of this earth, they're not of this kingdom. They're powerful, they're unseen, they're heavenly, they're real to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for you wrestle not against flesh and blood, blah, 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 blah. So we talk about the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of peace, and all, all, all those things. Out of all of the parts of the armor of God, which one of them can be referred to as a weapon? Sword, right? I was going to tell a joke, but it's not good. Okay, so... Use the sword of the Spirit, which is also called 
the Word of God. Now let's get an understanding of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here it says the weapons. He said, well, there must be more than one weapon. What am I missing? I believe the weapons referred to here are talking about the truths, plural, of the Word of God. Because when you understand the truth of God, you can begin to take every argument, every idea. Some ideas come from you, and some ideas will come from the enemy. And you can take that idea captive by knowing the truth of what God's Word says. You can recognize, this thought is not good. This is sinful. This is unholy. This is covetous. This is jealous. This is You can do that through the Spirit and the Word of God. Sometimes you need to take thoughts captive. Um, this isn't in the message, so the Holy Spirit is leading us right now. You need to take thought cap, thoughts captive about yourself that are not from, they're not from God. I don't even know if they're from you. They might be from the enemy. But when you start to think about yourself in a way that God would not think about you, you need to shut it down. Amen. You need to take it captive. You need to recognize this is not of God. Amen? That's how we fight. That's how we take authority. That's how we're transformed. That's how the kingdom not only works in our spirit through the Holy Spirit, but the kingdom starts to work inside of our souls and even transform our desires and change our minds. It's the power of the living word of God, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, the truths of Jesus Christ that set us free. When you are obedient to the word of God, you are wielding the sword of the spirit. The weapons we fight with are the truths of Christ. Now, as this pertains to our relationship, plural, as our relationships, our job is not to force others to believe. It's not your job. You can't, you can't force anybody to believe anything. You can't do it. And, you know, uh, somebody might have a problem with me saying this, but in this way, I think I think the gospel, I think the kingdom of heaven is very democratic in that the Bible says, choose this day who you're going to serve. It's your choice. It's not somebody else's choice. It's not your job to make somebody else believe, but it is your job to demonstrate the kingdom in how you live. So that when people come in contact with you, they're coming in contact with the king and they're coming in contact with the kingdom. We have to, if we're going to demonstrate the kingdom on the outside, we have to start embracing the kingdom on the inside. We have to take captive every thought and submit it to Christ and measure it according to the word. It's that kind of obedience that allows the kingdom to take hold inside of you. That's when your life becomes a stronghold for the kingdom. Your obedience cannot force somebody into a relationship with Christ, but your obedience can certainly extend the kingdom in a true and powerful way. As the subject, or as a subject of the kingdom, God wants the kingdom to be at work inside of you. God's kingdom is extended wherever his lordship or rule is established. Let me ask you today is Jesus ruling in your heart? Is Jesus ruling? ruling in your heart. Now, the default answer would be to say, yes, we're going to say yes very quick. But here's the, here's the thing. It doesn't really make sense to say Jesus is ruling in our hearts if we know that we don't really even have a desire to spend time with him in his word. Amen. It doesn't make sense. So while that might be a very pointed comment, it's just one that says, wait a second, maybe there's something going on inside of me that's not right. Maybe there's thoughts and desires that I have that's not right. You're among friends. We all have that. But are we offering that in relationship with, to God and letting his truths come in and replace the junk with his life? That's when the kingdom comes, when his will is done inside of us, and then his will is extended in relationship with others. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. This will be our last sets of scripture here. 
Luke 17. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, we want to know. We've got expectations about your kingdom. Okay? When, when do you think it's going to come? Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. It's not something that you can see. The kingdom of God isn't something that you can see. The Holy Spirit isn't something that you can see. The wind, in fact, isn't even something that you can see. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects that are caused by the wind, right? So people should be seeing the effects of the kingdom of God at work inside of our lives. But let's look on at what Jesus said. Verse 21, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. You see, the kingdom of God was in their midst because the king of the kingdom was in their midst. The king of the kingdom wants to come in contact with your life through his word. The king of the kingdom wants the ministry of his life to flow out of you so that when people come in contact with you, they can see, I've come in contact with Jesus. And they may not say that at first, but when they see the love, they see the joy, they see the peace, they see the gifts, they see these things, not that you're trying to put it on, oh, I gotta make myself look good. Do you ever get, I get tired of living like that. I don't wanna live like that. It's too much work. I need goodness to flow out of me. I need the Spirit of God to well up like a spring of living water inside of me and flow, because that's what other people need. They don't need me trying to fake it till I make it. They don't need me trying to be the best I can be. They need Jesus in me, amen, and in you. If we belong to King Jesus, when someone comes in contact with us, they should be coming in contact with the kingdom. So I want to close today in just asking you a couple questions. The first is this. Has the kingdom been activated inside of you by being in God's word daily? Has the kingdom been activated inside of you by being in God's word daily. Say, I don't, Pastor, I don't even have a desire for that. I know, I understand, I've been there, and you're not going to get one until you do it. Because that's what faith is. Faith isn't just what you think. Faith is what, according to the Bible, it's what you do. You can't be in faith and do one thing and think another. You can't do it. We, it's, it's, we, we've, we, we get there. We've got to get there. Amen? It's it wouldn't make sense to say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. I love you. How would you like to spend time with me in your word? Nah, I'd rather not. Doesn't make sense, does it? The kingdom wants to come into your heart and your mind and your life. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Has the kingdom been activated inside of you by being in God's word daily? Next, then, we need to ask, has the Lord, ask the Lord, how do you want me? So let's, let's say you're doing that. Let's say you're getting in God's word daily. But um, maybe, it, maybe it has become routine. It's not really about relationship. It's more about routine. It's like a checklist thing. Con continue to be obedient and ask God when you sit down with him, just empty yourself of everything and say, Lord, I really want to be with you in this time. Will you reveal yourself to me? If you submit yourself to God and draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Amen? It just, it'll just happen. He wants that to become the greatest thing in your life. The Bible says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to be alone with his Father. Amen? He wants to teach us to do the very same thing. We need to ask the Lord how he wants us to bring the kingdom into relationships. So maybe you've got a relation. Maybe the Lord is going to speak to you today about your marriage, about your kids, about this, about that. And it's like, Lord, I really want this person to see the kingdom in me, but I'm worried about whether or not it's operating in it. Repent, be obedient, be in the word. And then as you're in relationship with, with the Lord, the Lord's going to show you. He's going to show you. He might begin to show you how to pray differently for this person. Remember, it's not your job to convince them. It's your job to show the truth of his kingdom, right? He might show you, you here's what I want you to do. I want you to call them. I want you to minister to them. I want you to, I want you to, you know, give them a gift. I want you to babysit for them. No, that couldn't be you, God. It must not be your voice. Okay. The Lord, the Lord will, the Lord always shows up where he is 
where he has desired and asked for. Whoever draws near to him, he'll draw near to them. So if you've got somebody like that, and you say, my spouse isn't believing, and whenever I talk about the Lord, it's like they get angry. Or, you know what, we'd love to have our son come with us to church, but the thing is, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. It's okay. I understand. I've been there. God's real. His power is real. His kingdom's real. He wants to activate his kingdom inside of you. He wants to set you free from any guilt or shame. Oh, it's your fault. You're bad parents. No, you're not. You just let the truth reside inside of you by being in God's word daily, and then you hold out the truth, and you watch what the power of God does. God is, this is not a social club. God is raising, God's made us a family, and he's raising up an army. And it's going to be an army of people who operate in his truth and show the glory of the kingdom through their lives. And I'm excited about you being a part of it. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. The Holy Spirit will show you. He'll show you. With our eyes closed and our heads bowed, I wonder if there's anybody here today who would say, um, Pastor Andy, I'm not sure if Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I want, I want him to be. I want to be forgiven. I want to be cleansed. I want to give a right response. I want to repent. I want to turn from sin. I want to turn to Jesus, and I want to live for Jesus. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I see that hand. I see that hand. Awesome. Just put your hand on your heart this morning. You don't have to do this to be saved, but it's just a symbol of what's happening. God, he sees your heart. He, he knows you. He loves you. He's brought you to this place and this moment to begin relationship with him. Maybe a fresh, maybe for the first time, maybe a fresh and a new. Just pray this. Say, God, forgive me. Jesus, I put my faith in you. Thank you for dying on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for paying that great price. I trust you. I give you my life. I turn from sin. I turn to you. I receive your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Teach me how to live. Show me in your word how to follow you. Thank you for making me a part of your family. In Jesus' name. Let's keep our eyes closed and our heads bowed. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. If you prayed that prayer today and you have questions about starting to follow Jesus, like if you want to know where to start reading in the word or if you need a Bible, please come and talk to us here up at the altar after the service today. We want to make sure that you have help in getting started doing that today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kingdom. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Let it be done in our lives as we're obedient to you. And help us this week to extend your kingdom because of who we are in you, abiding in you, letting you work in us. Lord, so that we don't have to put it on, but so that we can be who you want us to be. Let that life we pray flow into each relationship. And Lord, for those who are struggling to share you in a specific relationship, I pray that you would give them this week a breakthrough in showing that truth in that relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Uh, remember, scripture cards are up here. If you have questions, come up to the altar. Have an awesome week with the Lord. Amen.